Greetings, everybody. Scott Stevens here with another perspective. It is Wednesday evening. We have had an election, for better or for worse, happened since uh, we last spoke on Monday evening. What did we talk about? about tools. We talked about tools that particular night, especially towards the latter part, and how to deal with uh, the coming reset. And it, it's kind of crazy because we're in this situation stateside where we're dealing with another kind of a reset. That's exactly what elections are supposed to do is to reset the political system, to take that hourglass, turn it back over and give someone else a four year term. And then the other uh, portions of government get renewed or replaced depending on their performance or how they did in the election with the House of Representatives, the congressman, up every single time, accountable to the people every two years. Senators get a little longer gap in between their accountings with their constituents at a six-year interval, and the president falls in between at four years. So we're up on one of those four-year elections. And in my life, since I, uh, my first uh, election when I was finally old enough to vote at 18, that was 84. And that was the Reagan-Mondale election. And that ended up going to Reagan in an effing landslide. I think Mondale only got Minnesota and maybe one other state, New England, but that was it. So as we talked uh, and have talked about resets recently, let's uh, transition this and kind of move it over towards um, uh, transitions. Uh, we're, we're going to go through this uh, as a nation and by default, because the U.S. contains or holds and shares with the world, the uh, the reserve currency, it impacts global trade. It impacts the banking structure. It impacts so many aspects of life outside the United States. And that's why you'll see multinational companies or, you know, have an opinion on one way or the other, because because we own that U.S. dollar and have the ability to, to throw a fist with sanctions, you know, we've got a bit of an influence in that. And it depends on how each separate administration uses that influence they have with the dollar. Military aside, you know, because we've the last couple of years, we've actually had quite a few peace treaties in the Middle East and haven't started a new, a new war. And in some ways, that is amazing, despite all the efforts to accomplish a new war. In that particular case, it would be with Syria. All right. Transitions of and for power within government, money systems, sovereignty to administrative law. This one might take a much, much, how do I say, a harder fought battle to accomplish that one from sovereignty to administrative or from administrative law to a, a more individual kind of sovereignty. Battle to remain centralized. That is what we are fighting in many ways right now. As individuals, we'd like to have decentralized ways of communication, decentralized sources of food. The centralization, as we have, has, has been laid bare in front of us because of COVID, we can see the weaknesses within that system. And every single industry has had to respond in one way or another to the effects of centralization. And with that has come offshoring where so many jobs, and it isn't just the United States, that the manufacturing and single port, point supply of um, IV bags for saline used to be in Puerto Rico, hit with a hurricane. Now it is somewhere else. So rights of personal choice, that is a big one. And then, of course, thought and expression. All right, here's our contact uh, me. Page. I guess I could have this at the end of the show, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, Weather Wars, uh, in, Weather Wars Info on Twitter. This is probably where I spend more time than anything. All right. We do have a book coming out. Vicki uh, Vicky Helm, she might be in the chat box at one point in time, but uh, we've got this book coming out, Sink or Swim 2030, simply because after the, code, uh, the codemic, the pandemic broke, uh, it was apparent that things were changing. And they were changing at lightning speed. And if it's a pandemic or a real pandemic, uh, either way, we're dealing with this and changes are afoot. And most of us, because we're not privy to inside discussions at the highest levels of government in this in the, on this planet, will and can be blindsided. So it's best to be in an anticipatory state, uh, a forecasting state. 
and realizing that as wave after wave of this pandemic or its by uh, its byproducts, its by effects, its uh, consequences come upon us, that 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 sand beneath us, beneath our feet, is a bit unstable. So we'll do with that. And tonight, yeah, we'll just kind of touch on this briefly. Um, but absolutely, we are at a tipping point where we could see the collapse of society. And this got happened so great and so paralyzing that we just couldn't stand by and just let it to happen. So the 12 problems that we discuss in the book, and kind of one of the ones that uh, will, will hit us, nationalism over humanism. You know, we're one, pe- one world, one people. And just one look at each other, and we recognize, oh, human being. It's like dogs when they walk up to each other, oh, you're one of me. We've lost so much of that because all we're seeing is an identity, or we're creating around ourselves an identity, which in our eyes, which in our personalities and our thoughts supersedes our humanity. And if we can't be recognized for that identity rather than our humanity, then we begin to see and celebrate our differences and not what we have in common. And there's a big, big lesson, a divine lesson coming in all of this, because I I am very, very strongly of the opinion that nothing happens unless it is supposed to happen, that it is ordained to happen, that it isn't happening for the lesson that all of us will at one point or another gain something from. So there is this issue with with nationalism. And in many ways, I see that uh, rising up simply because of globalism that we have recognized we have lost so much in the last 50 years, especially in the last 35 years from globalism, that if we don't fight back, if we don't stand on what ground is left, that so much more will be lost and lost very, very quickly and in soon order. So yesterday being vote day, some of you did, some of you chose not to participate. So we're at the point where we're dealing with a transition of power within the government, not from government to government, even though we talk about, uh, you know, Obama coming in and then that, that the power of baton, uh, the power of baton is handed to him from Bush, but it's still inside the government. He's creating a new administration, not a new government. So if this is to remain true and trusted, then as Stalin once said, the people who cast the votes decide nothing. The people who count the votes decide everything. And you can see the wisdom in that very simple, very succinct statement. But those that count the votes must be able to be trusted. Otherwise, the legitimacy of the newly elected government will forever be questioned. But more interestingly, the agenda that comes with them. Because if if they had to get in by theft, by deception, by some other means that would fall outside the law, what is it that they want to come to power for? What do they want to accomplish that led them to the point that they had to do it through illegal and immoral means? And so when such vitriol exists, as we have seen over the last couple of years, how can trust be established to maintain trust in the process, let alone the ensuing system? And as I parsed Twitter today, there were many examples of poll workers who this one in, in Pennsylvania, a lot of people already voted. He, th- he claimed and you know, with his picture and everything that he had already tossed a hundred ballots for Trump. Saw another one where the guy took them out of the voting station on his smoking break, took them out of the field and burned them. If this is happening and people are bold enough to claim to do this, sh- take the video of it and share it. What else is happening that we are not seeing? And as the votes come in tick by tick by tick, then you can see where we have just these massive jumps where all of a sudden there's this dump of 120, 130,000 votes for one single side. And statistically, we are beyond a 14 standard deviation uh, potential for that to particular happen. So I, I like this statement. The only thing we did on election day is tell them how many votes we needed or that they needed on election night. Fascinating that you could game the system after the polls close. It didn't seem like it was that way when in the 80s and 90s, but maybe it was. Maybe it has always been. Any way you can get and stuff that ballot box, that opportunity, if it's available, someone of the moral character will show up to do it, to win, 
because it means that much to them. Transitions of power, two pictures, two different passes. Uh, this one, the first one in, in 08, and these transitions can and should be and have been peaceful. If not, the rule of law, the tranquility of the people as guaranteed by the Constitution, and then ultimately by default, the nation will lose itself. How long will it, might it remain lost if this tranquility cannot be maintained? And this has me a little concerned. There's a little bit of a pit in my stomach to see how this could go terribly wrong. And if a disaster strikes, and I'm only bringing this up because if a nation is divided, if a nation isn't looking at the ball, it's like a coach and his players, keep your eye on the ball. And if we're off overlooking here, we're not paying attention to the ball Boom, out of bounds, foul ball, missed three-pointer. You've missed an opportunity. The continuity is now gone. So if a disaster strikes, what if it's an earthquake? Another hurricane. What if it's economic? What if it is something where we have annoyed an adversary and they see a soft spot and can strike? What are we doing? If we're so consumed by these these little things that we leave wide parts of us open, so would we be capable of mounting a proper response within the wheels if the wheels are frozen? If this transition fails, ask yourself, what would we be open for? What would we leave ourselves exposed to? Smiles within these three, and this one absolutely a transition of consternation. All right, let's talk about money. This transition will happen, and we uh, and this is one of the things that we'll discuss in in the book because for Vicky and I, we both see that it is absolutely apparent that a transition with money is happening. The Federal Reserve, by design, created a fiat money system, and if you're based on a Ponzi scheme, and interest is charged, and debt has to be created to expand the base upon which the pyramid can grow. Every car loan, every house loan, every swipe of the credit card debt is debt added to the bottom of this pyramid to then lift it up higher and higher. So we're beginning to see a lack of trust, A, in the government, and this isn't just the last four years, and it isn't just the last 40 years. It is a long period of time. Even Woodrow Wilson, who signed the Federal Reserve Act, which was the first part of his first term in 1913, by the time he left office at the end of his second term, he lamented what he had done, that he had given away, in my words, the keys to the kingdom to the Federal Reserve. And this is something that I've discussed numerous times in earlier shows, that if you give a power outside of what is allowed by the Constitution, the power to create money, that power now owns the system. So we're looking at digital currencies because, honestly, to carry gold and silver around, it's a pain in the behind. I mean, silver is easy enough if it's a change, and as we see its value going up, it's going to be worth something. Who knows what a silver dime might be worth? It might be worth an entire tank of gas. That is entirely possible. But digital currencies seem to be the answer. They seem to provide us with a trustless third party, that the third party, meaning the blockchain and the miners, will do their work with us out, without us having to worry about it. Those blocks will be processed, encrypted, and shared to the network so that you can send $10, $10 million around the world in 10 minutes or less. And where's the banks? Not around. Not around. And if the banks become irrelevant and the people finally recognize that fact, that is one big, big freedom that would be returned to the individual. And then we would move to a currency, a means of transaction that is immune from inflation. And in fact, these di most of these digital currencies, not all of them, but most of them, would almost force the prices of things to go down. So, a pair of headphones sit by the computer, 150 bucks, 200 bucks if you buy a brand name. Bought it in Bitcoin. I didn't, but I'm just saying if you did buy it in Bitcoin in 2016, it was worth about a single Bitcoin. But today, worth less than a 20th 
of a Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin terms, the value of items continues to drop as that currency reaches an adoption. So we're seeing other countries, we're seeing other corporations, we're seeing family funds begin to move into Bitcoin, and that has profoundly profoundly supported its price movement up. And just looking at the charts, this baby is going to be over $100,000 per Bitcoin in just a short time. And you can buy a fraction of it, literally a hundredth, a thousandth, a ten thousandth of one, whatever the budget allows. And then you have a little bit of something, a little bit of digital silver, a little bit of digital gold outside the system and you're ahead of the rush. So money systems, one is either forced into this game, meaning that the fiat system is broken. The banks have collapsed. And that money that you have worked your whole life for, you're waiting for the social security checks. You're waiting for your 401k to mature. You're waiting for that government bond to reach its maturity so you can withdraw. And those are there or they're not there. And when the plug is pulled on the system, None of them will likely be there. So we're we're to the point where we're either forced into the game or you jump in ahead of time and you learn to swim before the need arises or simply becomes acute because of inflation. And this is a binary choice. You either need a digital currency or gold and silver or you don't. And today you don't. But the day is coming and it is pre-planned. I promise you it is pre-planned by those folks that have those meetings that you and I are not invited to, that day will come. All right, individual rights of personal choice. What do you eat? How fast do you drive? What do you drive? What kind of vehicle? How safe do you want the state to make you live? How safely do you want that to be? Do you want to have those kind of freedoms like your grandparents had? There were far, far fewer licenses required to live in 1900 than in 2020. Far fewer. This is an interesting rabbit hole if you're not opposed to rabbit holing. A separate government was formed on February 21, 1871. Congress passed an act titled An Act to Provide a Government for the District of Columbia, also known as the Act of 1871. Pay attention. See Act of the of the 41st Congress, Section 34, uh, Sessions 2. Within this act, and, and it, Congress had no constitutional authority to do this, Congress created a separate form of government for the District of Columbia and its particular 12-square-mile parcel of island. What essentially happened is the United States became a corporation instead of a government. And we became individual properties to that government. And if we look at how law has changed, lawyering has changed, how banks have changed, and how companies have the right to personhood has has come upon us, then this particular act makes a whole lot of sense. And this is something that will not be changed in the short term, but it's something we all need to be aware of. And if you want to look at this up close, just yeah, I could I could do this for a moment, but you could also pause the video and do some comparisons between administrative courts and common law courts. One is the land of the sea with admiralty and maritime law with commercial jurisdiction versus common law. It's the people's jurisdiction, incorporated courts versus non-incorporated courts for dead entities and living people. Have you ever wondered why? on your birth certificate or any communication that has to deal with a bank or so forth, that all your name is in all capital letters, all capital letters. And that is you as a company. That is your straw man. But ultimately, if you're curious about which administration you are working within, if you go into a court or you're watching a person speak, look at the flag. The flag declares all. And if it is gold fringed, and that is a color that is not authorized inside the Constitution, then you know you're looking at one of these structures, one of these administrative courts or administrative representatives of admiralty law. And this 
this structure, this sovereignty allows them to tax you. And that's why when we are born, we're given a birth certificate, much like a ship coming into port. It takes birth. So as you're born, your parents register you with the government as a corporation by receiving and signing a birth certificate. Mine even has my footprint on it saying, I have landed. I'm ashore. In a few years, your corporation will then receive a taxpayer ID called a social security number. This is so you could be used as collateral for the government to acquire debt. And this was the agreement after 1871 when the nation was broke. And then in 1933, after the nation was broke once again, they had to do something to collateralize their their funding, their liquidity. And you and I were that answer. So it is our labor and time that essentially they have borrowed from us to operate. And so this nation is 250 years old. And in a way, we're been dealing with this creeping globalism that has been recognized as the tool, or let's just say, has it been recognized as the tool for enslavement that it could be? Are we frogs in a not quite yet boiling pot of water? Is the heat even on? Or is it just a comfy swim and everybody's happy with the level of freedom, the level of liberties that you currently enjoy? Is that enough for you? Or do you desire more? Is this the reason why nationalism has returned on this and also the European continent? The EU experiment is not that old. And already those sovereign governments from Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, well, Slovakia and Slovenia now, and Albania and all these other Eastern European countries are wondering, did we do the right thing by accepting membership in the EU? Considering we now cannot run our own courts, we cannot determine what is right and wrong within our own borders. The EU in Brussels has taken that over. And it's interesting when we look at Brussels in particular, how many U.S., multi, what used to be multinational companies have been bought back. And that wealth, that continuing cash flow has been taken from the United States and sent overseas. All right. What we all, else we saw, and I'm talking about rights and personal choices here, is that this yesterday in particular was a repudiation of the 50 years old drug war. That war on drugs continued Tuesday as voters in several states continued the liberalization of decades-old laws. Voters are speaking and reclaiming their right to choose. It was just in the early 70s, but even before that, as prophets, as the, the oligarchs, if you will, wanted to change health care. The Rockefellers with, eh, we got to make a pill for this. we got to make a pill for this. We've got to make this illegal. And so there has been this previous to the 1970s, even before that, a 50 plus year to change and control health care because it was decided that we needed, they needed a nation of workers rather than a nation of innovators and thinkers because innovators and thinkers are troublemakers, Right. So Rocky, as in Rockefeller, the governor of New York, this being 1973, the first first week of that year, Rocky asks life for drug pushers and then wants watchdogs over, over schools. And then Kennedy, just a few years later, uh, unveils an anti-drug strategy. This all in the early 70s. And the reason was just the 60s. The 60s, too much free love, too much this, too much that. It was such a radical change from the 50s and before where society was very different. And the 60s came along with Vietnam and it just completely recolored the relationship with people and drugs. And the government said, no, we can't have that. But these laws quickly filled hundreds, hundreds of newly built for profit prisons. But laws had to be written and passed to weaponize the legal system, ultimately criminalizing many people for their own personal choices. And the incarceration in the United States blew up after that particular point. It is the primary form of punishment and, believe it or not, they're calling it rehabilitation for the commission of felony and other offenses. 
the United States has the largest prison population in the world and the highest per capita incarceration rate. In eighteen, the U in twenty eighteen, the U.S. there were six hundred ninety eight people incarcerated per one hundred thousand, and that includes the rate for adults and people tried as a, as adults. The population in the U.S. six point four. 1 million incarcerated, adult correctional population on probation, 3.5 million, number of prisoners in the U.S., 1.43. And what I see it is that we're dealing with tough on crime. That was the campaign slogan, and that's why I'm talking about it right now. That mantra, that that tough on, on crime has been and resulted in decades of lawfare using the law as a form of warfare against the poorest and most disadvantaged. And they simply manufactured offenses solely for the purpose of profit. The lawyers get a take, the police get a take, the courts get a take, and the prisons take the most of all because they take the life and they keep it for as long as is possible because there is incentive, monetary incentive to keep people put away. So what people have done, and Colorado was blazing the way back in 2012, no pun intended, but to bring part of those choices back, to legalize those choices that were taken back in the 1930s. So yesterday, Oregon moved it a step further, decriminalizing small amounts of heroin and cocaine as four states legal at four additional states legalized marijuana. There were 38 statewide citizen initiatives, citizen initiatives being decided across the country on Tuesday, about half the level of the last presidential election. So it just shows that voters are eager for a new approach on drug policy to handle as health issues and then prioritize treatment. She said it was expected that other states will follow suit, mentioning efforts such as California, Vermont, and Washington. Separately, Oregon voters also legalized psilocybin, psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms for those 21 or older. Proponents said the move would allow the drug to be used to treat depression, anxiety, and other conditions. And that is a very fascinating rabbit hole of research if it's something you wanted to jump into. Yeah, let's 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 reload, see what happens. So um all right, that is not possible. So um crazy, because that would be the end. All right, so where we are with that is that the people have decided enough is enough. The people are paying for it. They're paying for the criminal justice system. They're paying to keep people put away and the consequences that that has on society, consequences on family, consequences on children. And it's just been too high a price to pay. So ultimately what is happening is is people choosing to take back that power take it back and rewrite the laws and deal with treatments, much like Portugal. Portugal in the year 2000 decriminalized every single thing. And that was absolutely the best thing that in hindsight that they could have done, because then that takes another police incentive, a lawyer incentive, and a prison incentive out of cops running around the street looking for someone to get. All right, this this, this is crazy. I, I need to be reload. Let's try that. This is like six slides that are all of a sudden missing. All right. The battle to remain centralized to break free decentralized systems. Uh, We're dealing with communications and the freedom of speech right now. We have allowed, and in fact, by our own usage, chosen certain platforms to patronize. And we know because we're not paying for that privilege to patronize those social media platforms that we become the product. I'm the product. I show up, I open the app, I'm for sale. And they sell my eyes, they sell my ears, they sell the opportunity to approach me to their advertisers. And to keep everyone happy, they feed us what we want to see. So we keep coming back. Why would you show up on a platform? Why would you go to a store, a restaurant, a theater, a department store? If you weren't weren't, ha- weren't having a good experience or didn't expect to have a good experience, and every time you pop that icon, the app opens up, 
and you're expecting a good experience. And one of Tracy's show, shows last night, the guy said, oh, you're seven and a half miles into your feed. I'm like, seven and a half miles, but that is so true. You scroll and you scroll and you scroll. So what we're looking at is where we, what do we do? We're to the point where we're decentralizing communications once again, and there are platforms. So back in 19, or in 1616, the papal congregation of the index banned all books advocating the Coper Copernican system explaining planetary motion. Do people today even know what that is? That just means the sun is the center rather than the earth is the center. But it wasn't for nearly 150 additional years before that that ban was lifted as the Age of Enlightenment mo moved across the world back in 1758. So why ban the telescope? Because then one has a tool to see. What happens when you see? Then you can understand once you can see. But what happens when you understand? Then you can think clearly. When you see and think clearly, then understanding of how to act in a given situation becomes clear. And this is where censorship interrupts that process of understanding. You don't buy a car. You don't buy a house. You don't make a big purchase without previously doing your research. If you can't get the full bit of information because some of that information has been set aside, then we're missing the opportunity to be able to see and act appropriately. So liberty is always freedom from the government. You know, because because even Lincoln and, and Washington are like, well, what's liberty? And this was probably uh, one of the clearest definitions. I mean, I'm kind of a guy, the fewer the words, the better, because then it gives us the broadest means of interpretation. Liberty is always freedom from the government. And that is more than a, I suppose, freedom and liberty kind of go hand in hand. So politics is the show to divide and distract. Moral compromise has its privilege because you can do things, you can motive, you can maneuver in ways that you're are not expected of you because you're working with people that still are operating by that's right or that's wrong. So if there's an aspect of people that you're negotiating with, working with, working for, or maybe they're working against you and they're dealing or living from a position of moral compromise, they have a position of power over you because it's a blind spot where they're going to behave in ways that you can't yet anticipate. And some things are more important than doing the right thing. This was all in a show I watched last night. These were words that are in media in, out there to be consumed. And it's a very, very different, different way of looking at life. And I've had a dream about this particular person three times. And one, the first one, the city of New York was in chaos, broken buildings, boarded up things. There was chaos and the man was standing in the middle of the street. This was three, maybe four years ago now, back in 2016, completely had no idea that uh, it, actually, it was a little while before I really recognized it. Oh, that's that person. So there's an agenda out there with people that are compromised, that have enough of everything that they want for nothing except to either impair people or empower people. It's a choice that they make. And because they have such incredible resources, their impacts on society can be widespread and long lasting. And we need to be aware and understand that those kind of people walk among, amongst us. And as Martin Luther King said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence. We've probably all been in a situation where sometimes it's just best to zip it up and let the situation de-escalate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence adding deeper darkness to the night already devoid of stars. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's the light. That is the light that we're waiting for and anxious to see soon, soon. Because I, I have this anticipation that we are hungry for that day to finally arrive.
All right, here on Metadime, got a couple of other shows. Vicki Helms Coffee Break Show, Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock Mountain and Tracy's Unlock Show. She comes to us from Australia. So it airs Tuesday, Thursday, Mountain Time. Uh, that stateside, and then this show nine or eight o'clock on Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, Mountain Time. All right, come back over here, do a little uh, run through the scrolling here. Amir shared it to some of my pay pays. Oh, the, oh my goodness, you guys have been going. Uh, there's no way I'm going to get through all those. I don't believe Susie. Good to gra- he would be a great guest. Uh, we'll have to talk about that. Um, cryptos. I'm I'm sorry. I'm really a fan. I can see how powerful they can be because they bring in accountability. And that is what is missing in so many levels to, to government and business alike is accountability. If there are laws that are established and passed by Congress, it's almost as if there is an, an anxiety, an anxious push. Let's see how we can get around that one. And they either lawyer up or just cheat. It just happens. All right. Uh, I just did. How much you can share? Yeah, there's things you can share. In the future, if you're streaming to other SM platforms during your live show, could you post the links in the description below? Yes, Facebook is useless. I could do that. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if I can generate the links, but somebody might have to do that uh, for me. They can get on on the show and then grab it and then share it out because I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, we're really at a, at a turning point, folks. Uh, I've done a show called The Fourth Turning. We're, we're undergoing a reset. But there is without question, without question, because you're so important. Each one of us is so important. That's why this game is being played for keeps, because you're important. You are valuable. But also, none of us are alone. And you get that pit in the stomach because you see what's happening out there. And you're like, oh, I don't know what I can do. I don't know what I can go on. And I know there's stress, Europe going through another lockdown, and a lot of these families, especially the entrepreneurs, the small businessmen, the small business families, are being pushed very strongly towards a a point of crisis. And if they spend everything they have just going from day to day to day, how do they begin again? How do they start over? And I have the sense that it's ultimately an agenda to where we're forced to live on a universal basic income. And so this is why one of the main reasons why I'm such an advocate of getting some fiat right now into digital currencies. So we have a little bit of a life vest. Maybe even it's just one of those little blow up ones you get on the airplane. It's a little something. And if you understand and begin to do research into the, into the digital cryptocurrencies, you'll see that, Oh, the light will go on and you'll, you'll understand why there's some, of uh, not quite fanatical, but a very devoted group of, of people to keep seeing this uh, invention to and through to the common person, just because it solves so many issues. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Good to see the numbers in there now and again. Uh, you're, you, my father always told you six girls walk, walk away with integrity. All right. Um, love you all. I'll catch you on Monday for another perspective. I know this election thing will be a little farther down the road one way or another, but, um, nonetheless, uh, a, a grand, grand transition slash reset reevaluation of where we are, um, is underway. Have a great night. I guess I'm back in a little bit to talk a little wet weather at nine o'clock. I'll see you then.